on this computer. Okay, so here we go. Welcome. This is the second in the series of the affiliate orientation training. The first little video, it's about a 20 minute video, just telling you what you bought, how it works and things of that nature and just giving you a bit of insight into that. This is going to be a more practical one where I'm going to deal with specific things in the, in the sense that you now have this material and you want to go ahead and you want to actually start running training courses. So, History is that Penny and I started this company about 10 years ago. I come out of a health and safety training background. I was with NOSA. Uh, prior to that, I was an officer in the Navy. And prior to that, I was a policeman. And being a cop, obviously, I understand the legislation that goes behind occupational health and safety. We start, started this co uh, company, uh, IntraSafe, about 10 years ago, so that we would provide training material to other people. And I love writing, I love researching, I love doing that sort of stuff. But I also realized when I was running my training company that there was no way that I could do it all. I couldn't sell and market and administrate and do all the admin and legal and run courses and develop training programs. And it just stressed me out completely. So that was where the need arose. And I'm trusting, and I'm sure, in fact, feedback is so that we're helping people provide them with content rich material which they can then modify so, now, personally uh, more recently i've been involved with siosh i was one of the speakers at the siosh conference in 2018 intrasafe is a corporate member of siosh and i have a, a close relationship with the the management of siosh because we have a lot of vested interest in the occupational health and safety training um, earlier this year i was nominated onto the Health and Safety Advisory Committee, and we've been interacting with Thibault, that's him there in the middle holding the copy of my book, <laughs> and that's an advert, advert for us, so we got Thibault to endorse it. But what is very important about this is this whole health and safety thing is changing. The, the landscape is changing, you will hear terminology that is confusing, you'll hear about people claiming certain things, and the SASH Health and Safety Advisory Committee is there to clarify, to clear up, to to make it a lot easier. And we'll be talking and uh, touching on this thing of CETA, QCTO, NQF, and all of that in this presentation today. And we, um, we have some really exciting announcements that we'll be making early next year with regard to SIOSH and the health and safety training industry. We publish these training programs, and there are 13, there are more under development, and each one of these training programs then provides the trainer or the affiliate with material that they can go ahead and they, they can start running training courses rapidly without having to go through all this research and development process. We've been working at things like unit standard alignment, and we've been working on issues relating to legal compliance, and I'll touch on those. But you can see there's the 13. Um, we are just reworking the first aid um, level one course at the moment so that it is unit standard aligned for those who want to go for CETA accreditation so they can do first aid training, but more in the presentation. Of course, being incredibly blessed by the fact that this book, The One Minute Safety Manager, has now been put into 87 stores around the country. Um, bargain books have taken it and they, we, we think, we believe it's the first ever health and safety training pro, uh, book health and safety training book that is on a national um, distribution shelf or stores. So just to popularize occupational health and safety, we've got to get these books and publications into places where people can use them and we can reach the market. The, I call them the untrained market, like the supervisors and managers and executives who have no clue no clue whatsoever, or they think they know, but they don't actually know. And that's where the um, One Minute Safety Manager started filling that gap. But we're also really blessed. We've got it on Kindle and Amazon, and we have I don't know how many we've sold now, but it's now become an internationally uh, recognized book. It's not, not world famous yet. It's not a bestseller. My first book that I wrote that was a bestseller, we sold 25,000 copies of the book, Movers, Shakers, Moaners, and Groaners. So... That's where this book plays a part, and obviously all the affiliates will have copies of the book. And of course, I'm not sure if you know this, but if you want to actually distribute the, the, the book to your clients, uh, you just chat to Penny, and she gives you a preferential affiliate rate, which means that you can either on-sell it, or you can give it as a gift. Here we go. Let's get straight into the process. Now, the whole process was that you applied, you were then accepted, and you became an affiliate. And part of the affiliate license program is that you would then be licensed from a copyright perspective to run these training programs as and where and when you need to. You would have received your certification and every single year you'll receive a new, modern, up-to-date certification. And in 2019, we're going to be adding a QR code to this certificate as well. And if you don't know what a QR code is, it's one of those things that you just, you can scan and it immediately takes you to our website just to verify that you are 
a, an affiliate licensee. And this because this is a problem. We see there are many companies making claims that they're accredited or registered or approved or whatever, and it's in, almost impossible to find out whether they're telling the truth or not without a PIA or a poppy um, application. So the affiliate license, that, uh, that document, please let me know if you don't have it and or um, I'll let you know when the new ones come out. The objective of this training is to do a couple of things. The first thing that I want to do is want to make sure that people know what they've got in their hands. So we call it unpacking the training material. And we'll talk a little bit about the delivery of the training material, the components, how you get replacements. We'll talk about the content. We won't be getting unpacking the content in depth, but we'll definitely be looking at the methodology and the updates and so forth. Now, having this material on hand means that you can get up and running as quickly as possible. However, you guys are going to hear me talk about this a lot. I have often looked at, scrutinized, and evaluated CETA accredited training programs that are, in my opinion, non compliant. They do not meet the requirements of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And you're going to hear me talking about risk specific, risk specific, risk specific, risk specific, till it's going to come out of my mouth and your ears. Because unless a training program is risk specific, it does not comply with the Occupational Health and Safety Act. It can be unit standard aligned, the company can be a CETA accredited company, but it's got to be risk specific. And we'll talk about that a lot. Okay, then of course, you'll be able to customize it in the sense of adding additional material, creating additional support material, and I'll share quite a lot of that with you in these sessions. We're gonna teach you how to integrate the technology so that you can actually use this technology. You can go out and present it. Now. People in the health and safety game are often not professional trainers. They come out of a technical and or health and safety background and they're not communicators as such. So I, this is one of my absolute passions. I wrote a book on it and I'll be sharing that with you in the new year. But being a presenter or a communicator is critical to get this message across. And I'll be talking about the various processes involved, uh, presentation, facilitation, training, what the differences are, how important they are. We'll be talking about learning methodologies and modes. We'll talk about attention and retention and recall and training people so that we meet their needs. We know the demographic in South Africa is such that it's not easy just to train everybody on exactly the same training program. I'll be talking to you about your own confidence, your own image, your own presentations. And I'll even be touching on things like sales and marketing and how you can actually get up and running as quickly as possible with material that is acceptable in the marketplace. So we'll be talking about all of that. And there are a couple of other reasons such as this. It's in everybody in everybody's interest that the health and safety trainers develop a reputation and stay in the marketplace. We unfortunately, like coffee shops, see health and safety people come and go, and then the next thing is they're running a coffee shop <laughs> and so forth. And, but we want you to succeed. Penny and I want you to succeed, and I want you to succeed for your own family, your company, and community sake, so that you can develop a relationship with your clients. Now, again, I'll touch on this, but I made a lot of money and great friends within the health and safety training game by customizing my training for their specific needs. And after putting all that time and effort in, I needed to be there when they called me so that I could service them. And I had clients, I had a client phone me a little while ago saying he needs a health and safety rep training program. I said, well, I don't do it anymore, but on my affiliate scan. So there we go. Let's get into the methodology. You receive this training material either by WeTransfer and or Dropbox, and it came in a format a word for Windows format or PowerPoint format. Now, I love those two applications because they're so easy to use and easy to modify. You've got various components, and I'm just using the example of the hierarchy here. So there's a facilitator guide, learner guide, there's facilitator um, visuals or PowerPoints, if you like, course material and certificates and various pieces. So you've got these different components, and you can literally un unpack it, go through it, and then start presenting it. We'll talk about that in a moment. So the first thing that you need to do is download it, put it into a subdirectory, save it, put it onto a hard drive, stick it into the cloud or something like that, so that you've got the material. You've got the master material. But if for some reason you should lose that master material, all you do is you let us know and we'll drop box it to you again. It's as simple as that. Now, what would also be important is that if you're going to be customizing your, your, this training material, that what you want to do is that you want to save these as two different files. Save the master file on, in a subdirectory, and then the stuff that you're working on, that you're customizing in a subdi another subdirectory, so that you don't confuse the two layers. 
then you can start adding in all your bits and pieces and the risk profile as required. And I love using the cloud. So I've got this little picture of the, <laughs> the world, but I send everything to the cloud because I can then pick up, if I were to lose my laptop, I can pick it up literally anywhere in the world. And that is unbelievably useful. Stuff we did previously. Okay, now the methodology is just three phases. The first one is the preparation. The second one is the printing. And the next one is the presentation itself. If you just think of those three phases, let me get into the first one. The preparation is straightforward. When you take your uh, facilitator guide, and I suggest that you print a copy, you can then literally have a look at it. You'll see in the facilitator guide, there are icons. It tells you what to do, say what activities to participate in. But because it's um, Word for Windows, you can add in bits and pieces. You can put in your own colors. You can categorize them. You can put in your own icons, whatever it is that you want to put into your facilitator guide. I would bind that facilitator guide and then use the facilitator guide and the PowerPoints as my, my keynotes. I love PowerPoint because those are essentially my, um, my, my cue cards. They allow me to go through the presentation because I can see them in advance. I'm, um, I'm using Microsoft um, 10 here. So I can see both what's coming up and I can also see what is on the screen or what my, my learners would be looking at. So, the preparation is easy. This is a Sunday afternoon activity, or now for the people that are going into the festive season, when it's a bit quieter. So you've got your facilitator guide. Then I suggest that you print your PowerPoints. And you know that you can print them up in a small format, six on a page, ten, uh, nine on a page, I think it's in increments of three. And you would then have a highlighter, and you'd have post-it notes, and you sit at the dining room table, and you physically go through this, say this, do this, ask this, show this. And on paper, you can then start doing your editing. Now, you don't have to do everything at once. So in the preparation phases, I say to people, prep and then present once or twice in sort of a, um, excuse me saying this, but in a, uh, a trial and error kind of fashion so that you can see what works. I strongly urge people to do that, get a couple of guinea pig guys together and set them down, do a free training program if you want to, so that they, they then become your guinea pigs and they can give you feedback and you can then customize and you can adapt and modify and, and streamline this program as you need. Then we start getting to the real meaty stuff. Now you'll understand it when I talk about it in a short while that this Occupational Health and Safety Act is very specific, that everything has to be risk specific. If it's not risk specific, in my opinion, then it's actually a waste of time. And we see people going on courses that are not risk specific. They go sit 20 people in the course and the facilitator say, I did it when I was at NOSA. I did it when I had Intratrain. I would stand there in a public course and I would go blah, 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 blah. And these poor guys would literally just have to go, well, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I remember a woman saying to me, but we don't have stacking and storage and ladders and scaffolding. Why did you teach it to us? Somebody else said to me, but we don't have machine guards. We don't have machines <laughs> for machine guards. And then you start realizing, gosh, we're actually missing the mark here. We spend a lot of time talking about things that aren't relevant to that group. So this is where you will then start collecting the documentation, putting it together, and customizing this training material. If you're running the training program for your own organization, then Nadia, for instance, you can just use your own documentation. But Eric and Letitia and Terence, if you're running it for a different organization, ask them in advance for this information, get this information and build it into the training program. Then we're coming to the printing side. And yesterday I chatted to somebody and he was saying to me, he's got this whole printing department and he runs it. I did that too. I would never ever do it again. I spent more money on my printing department than a good four by four would have cost. And, and eventually I couldn't get rid of the printers and I had um, leases and I had all kinds of things. I've come to the realization it's way better, way cheaper to use somebody else's equipment. And if somebody has got a service out there, use this service. So I, that's what I would do. Maybe there are certain forms that you want to print in the house, but I have moved completely far away from having a printing department with staff. And then one Friday afternoon I walked in and I found a pile of, Overhead, tra overhead transparencies that they dumped. It must have been about 5,000 rands worth of overhead transparencies. And that's the, what I was, my profit on a course. So I don't do it. But when it comes to printing, obviously we say quality, 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 and then copyright, copyright, copyright. But I've dealt with that previously, so I won't get into that one. Okay. Then we get to the presentation. Now, this is where it's becoming very exciting. Currently, the presentations, or in the past, presentations were done live person to person in a training room or something like that. But you could do a lot of this stuff using Zoom or um, any of these tools. 
But let's presuppose that it's going to be a live training session where you've got a classroom scenario and people seated around the table, a boardroom table or something like that. Then it's just a matter of using the tools that we provided, the facilitator guide, the PowerPoint, the learner guide, the pocketbooks where appropriate, whatever forms and documents and, and uh, checklists and things, registers and things like that. And you just keep on going, keep on going. Now, typical trainers would talk, talk, talk like me. I'm a typical trainer. I'm not naturally a facilitator. A facilitator would stop and gauge to see how much people have actually understood and get them to interact. There would be a lot more practice. I love the practicals. I did the walkabouts a lot. To me, that was a very meaningful thing. But nowadays, the modern facilitation processes are <clears throat> more interactive. Sometimes that's not convenient. If you go one day to run a training program, that's all they've given you, and you've got 10 people sitting in front of you, as much as you want to do all these interactive things, you have to be very clever. So this presentation side is of paramount importance. Now, you may or may not know this, but I got into the public speaking world by doing a Dale Carnegie course. Then I joined Toastmasters. I wrote a book on presentation skills, which I'll, I'll share with you. I used to be the MD of a company called Business Presentation Skills in Cape Town. Uh, it was one of the, um, I've done so many like, training related things, but I learned to present and I learned to instruct in such a way that I then made a living out of it. Speaking became my living. And I believe that it is almost more important that you can convey the message than it is that you actually have the knowledge. Because you can talk through um, a technical section, but if you can't convince and persuade and entertain people, if they don't enjoy this process, we know their brains switch off. Now, I do recommend that you do a train the trainer program. There are a variety of them. Uh, obviously, these ETDP CETA courses are generally quite good. Beware, be careful. Penny and I did an assessor course, an ETDP assessor course, which was fantastic. Loved it. Five days. I now see that people are running it as a two and a half day program. Just thinking, they're watering it down and they, they so be very careful when you're doing a um, facilitator, instructor, trainer course. Go somewhere where you know that it is credible and you're going to get the results from the people and check them out. Ask them questions. Okay, so. One of the things that people often ask is this thing about approval and accreditation. And I mentioned that we've um, we formed the committee, um, the Science Health and Safety Training Advisory Committee, because this has become literally an elephant in the room. It has got to the stage now where people ask the question, is the course accredited? But there's absolutely no legal requirement or no need for it to be accredited. We're talking about one day short courses, two day short courses, a three day short course. We're not talking about days, weeks, months. We're not talking about years where people go to a college, like an FET college or a TVET college or something like that. These are traditionally short courses. And this accreditation thing hovers over so many of these courses. And I've just got cheeky and I'm actually writing a paper which is going to be submitted for um, parliamentary, hopefully parliamentary review. It, the question is this. Why? Why do you want it um, accredited? And people come up with answers, like it's got to be BE, we're looking for BEE scorecard points, or um, we want credits for the people, or we want our skills levy back, and stuff like that. So this paper that I'm writing at the moment will be, we'll put it through Sayash, um, to address this thing. Now, there is no need that health and safety training be accredited. If you can get it accredited, that's nice from a marketing point of view. However, my next video is going to be on risk, and the one thereafter is going to be on this whole Sacrosita MQFD hit debacle. And I'm calling it a debacle because it's exactly that. I don't think there's much in the training world that frustrates people as much as this thing, but we're addressing it. And that's why I said there hopefully will be some, some exciting announcements in the new year. Now, it is important to know if the law does say it has to be accredited, it must be accredited. And there are these three categories that you need to be aware of first aid. Certain working at heights when it comes to the con um, construction regulations, you know, the fall arrest, fall protection stuff where the guys are wearing harnesses, that's got to be accredited. And then also certain operator training. Now, to, to just kind of give you a quick explanation of it, the number of words that you need to get your head around, and they are accreditation, approval, certification, legal compliance, registration, Unit standard alignment. Now, just pick those words out so that you can understand that there are differences. But the clients often do not know the difference. And they, go, they just go, is it accredited? And the example that I often use, I say to people like this, Terence, if I had to say to you, do you have a driver's license? You go, yeah. 
And then I said to you, well, yeah, yeah, my keys, can you quickly pop into town? That's it. Are you accredited? Yeah, yeah, my keys, you can train my people. It's like, wow, really? In any case, more about that later. And if you want this information, you can either watch it again or I can just send you these notes. But it'll be coming out in this paper that I'm writing at the moment. Let's look at legal compliance because that's where the rubber hits the road. The law says blah, 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 blah. Are we all familiar with, I call it the OHASA, the Occupational Health and Safety Act. People call it the OSH Act. I don't care what you call it. <laughs> as long as we're referring to the same piece of legislation. And we know that there are three components. There's the Act, the regulations, and the standards. Now, the Act, we know, 52 sections or thereabout, that piece of legislation is covered by the Act track, the training kit that you would have received. And that Act track, I've just extracted the salient points out of the Act track. Then we've got the regulations, and there are 20-odd regulations out there. And I often say to people, don't, don't freak out. Because not all of everything that's in the regulation is applicable to you, or in fact in the app. So we recently brought out the construction regulations, we call it the CONREGs, we've got one on noise, that's specifically related to a regulation. And then of course we've got the standards. And I asked the question earlier on, um, Eric, my question to you was, um, I said 40, 45,001. Now, there's a possibility, remote possibility, somewhere in the future, they may actually say that is the standard that everybody will apply in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So, important to know, important to keep your eye out. And certainly, if you remember of SIOSH, they send out these notifications very, I mean, re regularly and rapidly. The moment the, the, um, the draft is out for discussion, you can actually discuss it. And I've made a couple of comments on some of these regulations where they're either good, bad, or otherwise. But there we go. That's basically the Hasa. There is a, I call this the second elephant in the room. And this is thing called she. She has now become cool and popular and a trend, but it's not in the act. And I often see people going, and let's just add on an R for risk, and let's just add on a Q for quality. And when we're looking at the pure health and safety aspects, they're fading into the background. And yet that's what the act's all about. And that's where the death and disability and damage and stuff comes from. It's on the health and safety side. I fully acknowledge the necessity to have the ERC part, the ERQ or whatever you want to, uh, however you want to identify it. But we must not forget, there is no such thing as a she rep in terms of law. It's a health and safety rep. The E part is nice. And I must tell you something that I think it's become a distraction. Safety seems to get the entire focus about 80% of the focus is on safety. And yet, according to the World Health Organization and um, who's the other body, International Labor Organization, health is where the problem's at. 80% of all deaths are health-related diseases. They don't happen in the workplace. They only happen when the person gets into retirement from an old age home or something like that. And we've got this skewed view of, I'm the safety officer, and I go, well, do you have a health officer? And in fact, I can criticize my own book. It's called The One Minute Safety Manager. Should have been The One Minute Health and Safety Manager. But I'm sure you understand that. And this is something that we'll be addressing as well, is because we are flooded with all kinds of other requirements. And often, our incumbents don't have the training or the background. The goal number one is that the employer must comply with the legislation and prevent occupational injuries, diseases, disability, death, and all those sorts of things. That's the goal. Meet the legal requirements and stop the accidents and diseases, and injuries and incidents and things like that. That's the goal. Not SACWA credits, not SDL levy rebates. Our primary focus must be prevention of injuries and diseases. Then if we, and I'm sure you will agree with this, if we look at our health and safety management system within the organization, we often find that there are people missing out of this equation. For instance, the managers have never been on a workshop and they don't really know what their, um, their duties and functions and responsibilities are. Similarly, the supervisors find that they actually have an clue and they then focus their attention on production and they say, well, health and safety must look after. Now that is not a clever thing to do. So you'll see how you can start putting these training programs together and making up your own training. Well, one of our affiliates is doing something which is very clever. He is now running a health and safety officers course for his company. 
and they, they've got multiple divisions and he's drawing the guys in and he's putting them through all these different modules according to this, the needs on their risk profile and he's going to be running a health, he is, he is running a health and safety officers course and he issues his own certificates internally. So that was a really clear idea. Now, I've changed the order of the legislation a little bit. You'll notice that I've on section eight, the employer's duties, and I've jumped to section two. And it's almost like section one and section two should have been swapped around, but don't worry. But this is where the rubber hits the road. The Occupational Health and Safety Act says that the employer must establish the hazards attached to any work performed, then develop the precautionary measures, then provide the necessary means. Now you can't do any of the health and safety stuff if you don't know what your hazard or risk profile is. So to me, this is critical. Hire, 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 hire. And if a person says, come and do my training, you say, have you done a hire? Can you show me what your dangers, hazards and risks are? And I want a substantive hire. I don't want just to walk about it one day. And that's where the hire kit is so good. It really gets down to the nitty gritty of what is the organization's risk profile? What is the employee going to be exposed to? And from there, flowing from that, right now we can make sure that the place is risk-free. So again, the word risk. Risk, 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 risk. Flowing from that, we can then have a look at what the law says. We know what the dangers, hazards, and risks are. We've profiled the risks. We've scored it, high, medium, and low, or whatever the profiling is that the organization adopts. And based on that, the precautionary measures and what the law says in Section 8 is that the employer must provide information, instructions, training, and supervision. Now, people go, wow, isn't that the same thing? No. When I went for driver training, I did an advanced driver training course uh, way back when, in fact, when I was at NOSA, my driver training instructor had come out of the um, Rhodesian police, and man, he was something else. He was, in my opinion, he did such a good job that to this day, I've never yet had another accident. I was at NOSA 25 years ago. Not, I've not, I've kind of scratched the car occasionally, but I've not had an accident because his training was so good. And now we understand that there's a big difference. You can't sit in a classroom and tell people what to do without giving them the skills to do it. And that's the training part. So information is, ah, I get it. Instructions are uh, like those procedures, precautionary measures, uh, safe work procedures, step one, step two, step three, step four. And then training is the competency side of capability, the capacity of the individual to actually run the training. So for, for um, what it's worth, I would say that if you don't have a person that is capable of doing what it is that you taught them to do, then they've not been trained, they've been informed. But watch this. The law says you must inform them. So consider this. Much of our training that people say, is it accredited? You can say no. It's an information session. It's a briefing session. It's an update session. It's an awareness session. Because the law says you must inform them. Then the law says there must be instructions, the do and the don'ts, in a, in a written format of what to do and don't. And then there comes the training. That's where the drills and the practicals and the inspections and all of those sorts of things, what I call the walkabouts, that's where it comes. Now, Last thing that I'll just mention over there is it says, and supervision. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's talk about sex. Now that sounds like a song title, I think. There is a song title. And I want to talk to you about my daughter. I have a daughter. She's an adult now. She's um, well into her 20s. But when she was 13, 14 years old, it was our responsibility as parents to talk to her about the birds and the bees and sex in some other awkward manner. But now if we had to apply what the law says, this will just define for you what we mean by information, instructions, training, and supervision. So there she was, she needed information. The birds and the bees and show her video and show books and show her whatever it is that you would be bold enough as a parent to talk to your daughter or son about sex. Now at the age of about 17, 18, the mom, should start giving your daughter instructions of do's and don'ts and good and bad and nice and not so nice. That's instruction. And if you're a dad, you teach your son how to be a good lover because now he's coming into his later teen years and he's going to be in his twenties. And you actually say, do this, don't do this. Um, you know, like what's important in terms of being a lover and how to be a great lover and not just a bonker or someone like that. That's instructions. 
Then we get to the training. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to take my daughter or my son for sex training. This is something they're going to have to do on their own. Not so. And I think you understand that this under no circumstances and I'm, am I going to do any supervision? <laughs> That's called TMI, too much information. I'm not going to give my son or daughter um, training and instruction, uh, training and supervision. Do you understand now there are different things? Everybody needs to be informed that they go, oh. then the guys need instructions for guys and the girls need instructions for girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good, or that's not good. This is consent, and this is not consent. And this is where you should focus your attention, and blah, blah, blah. Training, mm, we'll steer clear of that, and definitely no supervision. But let me just move on and talk about the supervisor. You know, in my opinion, that supervisors are completely underutilized in the health and safety system. Completely. Now, the law doesn't define what a supervisor is. It just uses the term supervisor. So anybody could be a supervisor. The charge hand could be a supervisor. The chief executive officer is a supervisor. The manager department head, the executives are supervisors. In terms of the law, there's no differentiation of what is a supervisor. Supervisors don't necessarily wear blue overalls. Supervisor could be the human resources manager. That's a supervisor. But we've ignored them. We've focused almost all our attention on these poor characters called health and safety reps. Now, the employer needs somebody to represent them in the workplace. That's the supervisor, that's the manager, that's the foreman, that's the charge. But we forgot about it. The employer's representative is appointed in terms of Section 8 as a supervisor, and we saw previously that that supervisor must supervise what's going on in the workplace. We'll see it again. Now, they have duties. This is in their job description. You will. This is not, oblig uh, this is not um, uh, optional. This is obligatory. You have to do this. And then on the second hand, we've got these health and safety reps, which are nice. And I say that with respect because I like them, because they are an extra set of eyes and ears if they've been trained, but they represent the employees and they don't have duties other than duties as employees. But do you know health and safety representatives have functions which are optional, whereas the supervisor has duties which are obligatory. And how often do you hear of the supervisors going on a supervisory management course for health and safety? Now, I do know that there are some people that actually have a supervisory training program and well done. And I also know that human resources will run training programs for supervisors, but often the health and safety thing is not integrated into it. It's two separate things. And the law says it must be one thing. Okay. Does it say that? Yeah. It says that the employer must train up the supervisors and must authorize them. So we developed the super track, and the super track could be a phenomenally powerful course if you're training supervisors. I would say train them first. Don't worry about the health and safety reps just yet. Train the supervisors, because a health and safety rep without a trained supervisor is useless. He will or she will report something when nothing gets done about it. So that's where the super track is powerful. And then what do we train them in? The risk profile. It just frustrates me, and I'm sure you can see that when I see people are sent on courses and it's not trained to understand the hazards that they are exposed to. General hazards, many of which do not apply. So let me use this example of what I used to do. Um, I had intra-train and I was running training programs. So on, let's say Monday, I would go to Pick and Pay. Pick and Pay's head office is in Cape Town. I'd go down to the head office and I'd run a training program there. On Wednesday, I would jump in the car and I'd drive out to Paul and I would run a... a Exactly the same course for premium milling. Now, if you just look at the risk profile of pick and pay versus premium milling, it's vastly different. But I'd run the same program there. And then on Friday, I would be out at Ribia Castile and I would run exactly the same flipping generic program for PPC. And I started feeling really guilty. So it was then that I realized, make this stuff risk specific. And I would then sit with my client, I'd make an appointment, sit with the client, and we'd do a needs analysis. That's what we used to call it. But um, a gap analysis, if you want to call it. And I'd go, what are your dangers as a risk? What is it that you want me to train them in? And I'd get them to sign a contract based on that. And that's what I would do. I would train them, train them, train them. Train them. And of course, now we've got our supervisors trained. The next group of people that we have to train are employees. 
in maybe even in that order. And that's where this inductor comes in. And this is basic induction. The law says we must inform them. Now, do you remember I said in section eight, inform, instruct, and train? Well, yes, inform. But inform them. We don't have to train them. Although I'm saying train them. They need to be skilled and competent and capable. Then from there, we look at our health and safety reps. And here are a couple of interesting words in this section over here, section 18. And it talks about the employer providing assistance facilities and training as may be required. Now, consider what that just says, as may be required. Like dangers, hazards, and risks, forms, registers, appointments, structure, reporting system. And if you go to a health and safety rep course, just a generic one, I guarantee you that the, the learner will walk out without that specific stuff. I go, oh, yes, I, I got a little bit of information, now I'm trained. Having said all of that, look at what it says in the next sentence there. It says, and has, as has been mutually agreed upon. So beware, beware. If we send a person on a generic health and safety rep training program at client ABC, or a service provider ABC, and it has not been agreed upon, that course does not comply with section 18. It is actually in non-compliance. It could be accredited, whoopee doo but it's in non-compliance. Now, uh, these are things that keep, kept me awake at night. And it's one of the reasons why we formed this Health and Safety Advisory Committee, so Health and Safety Training Advisory Committee, so that we can address these things. Now, bear in mind, as a provider of training, whether you're in-house Nadia or Eric and, and Leticia, whether you're going out to clients, sit with the client and do a needs analysis. I actually heard somebody say yesterday in a meeting on a Zoom, Skype, uh, a Zoom meeting, she has a form that she fills in and she says, when she's sitting with the client, she says, do you want it to be unit standard aligned or do you want it to be legally compliant? And sign here. And inevitably they go, what the hell, it's got to be legally compliant. You go, fine. Now, why do you want it to be accredited? Now, once again, don't get me wrong. I'm not against the CETAs. I think the CETAs are great for TVET colleges and uh, FET colleges and universities and things like that. And there's a lot of corruption in that area. A lot of corruption, both by service providers as well as the management of CETAs. But at the end of the day, we are providing a service to our client so that they can be legally compliant and their employees can be safe and healthy and go home at the end of the day or the year or their lifespan. So this agreement, I'd like you to try and get your head around that and just see what do you think or what do they think? It means that the course is agreed upon. Content, methodology, the actual provider, the person that's gonna be standing in the training program, the demographic of the group and the, uh, the language that is going to be spoken, the practical exercises that are going to be performed so that the person is properly trained, these are things that must be agreed upon. Let's quickly talk about first aid training, because this one has been something that has been discussed a lot. But let's just move back a little bit. Previously, General Safety Regulation 3 used to say that if you had a certain amount of employees, 10 or more employees, then you must have a trained first aid provider. And we know that. And then, of course, you have to have a first aid box and there's a ratio involved. The first question that I would ask people is, do you have 10 or more employees? They go, no. Okay, so we don't have to have a first aid. And that's not even logical. That's not even logical. So in law, there is a principle called the reasonable man. And it is reasonable, then in that instance, for the employer to have a first aider on site or in the van or on the, in the field, even though they don't have 10 or more people. So if you're in the marketing business, marketing, health and safety training, there is an opportunity there. But they do not have to be appointed. That is critical. I'll tell you that in a moment, I'll get to that. Then, once you've got your 10 or more, then it has to be a level one, two or three course, depending on the needs of the organization. Level one is the primary one. Okay, so level one first aid course, we've got the first track there, and this course is being um, unit standard aligned at the moment. But level one first aid training needs to be risk specific. Have a look at what it says at the bottom there. It says the employer shall provide additional training if high risk, toxic, corrosive, similar hazardous substances are present. That doesn't happen. And I can tell you, even the major international first aid training organizations don't make that adaptation. And I have never ever, in what, 35, 40 years in the health and safety game, never ever 
experienced it where a first aid trainer adapts the training program based on the risk profile of the client. They just do a course. So if I was a prosecutor again, and I was a prosecutor in the Defence Force uh, when I was in the, in the Navy, I was a sub-lieutenant and prosecuted under the Military Discipline Code. If I was a prosecutor again, I would distinctly, definitely ask these questions. Did you do the additional training? High risk, toxic, corrosive, or similar hazardous substance? And are they written into the training program? And can you prove it? So there's food for thought. Okay, moving on here. Do you know that you can do first aid training for anybody? As long as it's not the appointee, the general safety regulation appointee. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. My son is a dive instructor and a commercial diver. I'm a dive master. Penny, my wife, is a, she calls herself a plug-in diver. I was also a Springbok scout, and I got my scout in oh, when I was 18 years old. We did first aid courses there. So I did first aid courses as a cub and then as a scout. Then I went into the police. We didn't do first aid courses there, but I went into the Navy, and we started doing rescue courses and junior leader courses, did first aid there. Then I left the Navy, and I became a Naui instructor, sports in, uh, not sorry, I became an Iowa diver, Nathan's the instructor. Um, and they put us through, well, we did voluntary search and rescue, we did first aid. All of those courses are called life skills courses. And you, if you feel comfortable and competent, we'll help you with that. You can run those first aid courses. You can run them at colleges and schools, you can do them for sports fields. They do not have to be Department of Labor approved. I have one client that is very effective where they train cleaning staff and caring stuff, you know, the, the ladies that go in to look after the aged people, they train them in first aid. And they're not Department of Labor approved because it's not an appointee. Not an appointee. This is a very important and vital thing because now we've got it to a stage where people say only um, Department of Labor approved people can actually run first aid courses. And I'm saying, no, not at all. What about these people? Would that mean that my first aid that I did as a scout or a cub or in the Navy or um, as a diver? not be valid and would it be no it's, not. it's life skills and you can do it so bear in mind there's a whole market of you but something that i do need to say is this first aid training as a result of the chief inspector's notice that came out in december has to be CETA accredited and this is where we've engaged on this whole subject of is it necessary and do we need to go through these processes because it is enormously expensive to get CETA accreditation Okay. Moving on a little bit, in the construction regulation, it also talks about induction. You'll see in the driven machinery regulation, it talks about induction the, uh, training as well. You will see that um, they talk about, they use a term called competency in the construction regulation when it comes to working at heights and fall protection and things like that. And more about that later. So now you can see how you can start mixing and matching and putting things together and develop training that is unique to that client's needs or that specific uh, workplace. Now, no, Nadia, you're in the construction industry. So this is something that you need to consider. And it's literally a matter of once you're familiar with it, you can cut and paste and modify according to your contractor's needs, the subcontractor's needs, visitor's needs, anybody that's coming on the site so that you're in compliance, first and foremost. And from there, I want to talk a little bit about what's in the kit. So... We've been talking about Hira, 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 and the importance of Hira. Now, just out of interest, there is possibly going to be new legislation in 2019. At the SIOSH conference, um, uh, Tibor Sanza, the chief inspector, made alluded to this amendment bill again. And I've had sight of this amendment bill, and it talks about step one, section eight, Hira, in those terms. If you ever want to see the document, the original paper that I, I received, uh, just let me know, and I can send it to you. But it talks about Hira. Now, from an opportunistic point of view, from a business point of view, more people we can teach to do a substantive hire, not just a walkabout, but a substantive hire. Wow, we, that's business for us, but it's also critical for the health and safety management system. I mentioned there's a facilitator guide, visuals, um, the learner guide, and the administration material, and I told you how it revolves to go from one to another. I also mentioned that some of our training programs are unit standard aligned according to whatever appropriate unit standard is to be used but but this is an area where there's a lot of gray because there's a transition from CETA to QCTO and QCTO does not recognize unit standard so I will provide a lot more information as I get the information to keep you updated okay so if we were to unpack the training material like we were talking about yesterday Eric the whole idea is that you would know what's in the training program You'll notice, and I'm just using the Hira kit over here as an example, that part one is introduction to SACWA. 
This is something that you do or don't have to do. You decide. If it's going to be a credit bearing course, then you do it. If it's got not a credit bearing course, just move on. Don't do it. Because I find that that section alone is like an hour, hour and a half. That's instructional time that I'm wasting on telling you about SACRA and CETA and the, the terminology and things like that. However, if it's unit standard line, obviously you've got to do it. Part two is introduction to she. Now, remember earlier when I was going, she, ah, oh, man, I don't like this she thing. But I have built it in because clients ask for it. It's the only course that I actually talk about she, because when it comes to a hirer, you can obviously assess the dangers, hazards, and risks from safety, health, and environment. Remember, it's not a legal requirement. Then, the identification of hazards, and we'll talk about different types of hazards, but most importantly, we'll start getting into the meat of it, such as examples, and I've got a comprehensive sheet of things that people should be looking at and considering, both in terms of the obvious as well as the hidden, as well as the, the emerging hazards that are going to come. And we'll be looking at things like frequency and probability and severity and sort of being able to measure it so that you can actually say, Dangerous assets and risks are up there. Now, for that to work properly, people need to know what the dangerous assets and risks are. And I have an example. I happened to be in Manchester. Penny was working on the Commonwealth um, Games, the opening ceremony. And I popped down to a friend of mine, that uh, ex-South African. Uh, he had immigrated and now unfortunately passed on. But he worked in a paint plant. And paint manufacturing, obviously, dangerous hazards and risk, big time. And when I got to the gate, literally, security pointed me at a board and said, these are the dangerous hazards and risk you're going to be exposed to. And these are our high risk. Here's your personal protective equipment. And un 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 um, escorted, he sent me into the premises following little colored footsteps. And I got into where um, Jock's office was. And as I got to the door of the office, it was like an external office, like a maintenance office, on the wall, risks. I mean, alone. the protective equipment, the procedures. I walked inside and he obviously introduced me to his, his buddies and friends like that. And on the wall, they had the names of the people, let's say A to Z, and the dangers, hazards, and risks that each person was exposed to. So you'd go, Jock, Jock is exposed to this, that, 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 and that. And these are the precautions. And here's the protective equipment that Jock must wear. It was that clear. Then on the way out, I noticed that there was a huge board on the wall, massive flood, floodlights. Uh, it would probably be digital now. So with the emergency services arrived on the site, they would know exactly where the dangers, hazards, and risks were and where the high-risk areas were. It was just like, wow. I, I've never seen that in South Africa, and I was with NOSA for five years, and we did, I think I did the first five-star grading for the old Celtics refinery. Pfft, it wasn't there at all. Okay. Then we move on, and we look at introduction to HIRA. What is HIRO, when we how, the processes involved, project management, all of process flow management, all of those sorts of things. I introduce things like rag tagging, that's red, amber, and green, and the tags and the stickers and the labels and the, that whole process, which can all be digitized now. Then the physical activity of conducting the risk, where you've got your team together and you actually take that team for a walkabout. And you know what? I often say to people that if you don't have a gazebo, a laptop, um, a generator, if you don't have lighting, if you don't have the appropriate equipment and or technology and or people, it's not a hire. It's not a hire. Hire teams have a gazebo and a flask of coffee and a laptop and they observe the process from start to finish. And then they observe the, the product flow or the, um, the raw material flow from start to finish. Not just walk in and walk around and walk out. That's what I was taught. I've come to realize there's so much more. Okay, now once we've identified this as a result of either the hire or the training that is taking place, those findings need to be managed and they need to be communicated. Even on the training course, you know when you do a health and safety rep walkabout and you go, oh, look at that. That, we're compelled to report that. That doesn't happen. You know when, when a, a learner goes onto a training course and comes back and goes, my gosh, I know about this problem in the workplace. It's not reported or generally not reported. But if it is reported, big ups to the person who taught them to report it. And then finally, there's a learner assignment. And we'll talk about the portfolio of evidence, but also any other assignments you may give to the person that's going to go away and then come back with their findings, their report, their project, or something like that. So now I mentioned to you that I made up this list, and I hope you can see this on your screen over there, but there's a host of things is biological dangers, hazards, and risks. We need to assess them. Are they a danger? Are they a hazard? 
or are they a risk? And if they're a risk, high, medium, or low. And if they are high, medium, or low, what is the score? Because then we can drive those scores down so that it becomes the workplace is healthy and free of risks. Ergonomics, as you all know, environmental issues, but these are not necessarily the environmental issues that we talk about in terms of pollution. These are environmental issues in terms of environmental regulation, the chemicals, hygiene, electricity, physical, mechanical, fire, explosion, health and safety equipment, and training and awareness. And you can see, you could write a book on every single one of those headings, and you could write a chapter on each one of those subsections. Maybe that's what we should do. As a result of our entire process, we should finish off, once we've done our hire with a comprehensive precautionary measures guide. Remember section eight said that? And that guide, I often see people and they get excited about these safety plans. And then it's cut and paste and you can buy a safety plan and just do a mail merge and cut and paste and things like that. Gosh, you know, who are we fooling? Who are we fooling? This is just, this is almost irresponsible. This is what needs to happen. And that book, that manual, then becomes the health and safety manual for that year. Next year, we do it again. Change the equipment, do it again. Any modification, do it again. And we add to that manual. So that manual then goes hand in hand with our risk profile. Okay, so you've got that. Now, each one of the trainers' kits also has a certificate. And um, the newer trainers' kits, you'll notice, unfortunately, I should have put the slide in, my apologies. But we have changed the certificate process. And I want to just mention to you that certificate fraud has become, well, it's popular, it's in the press, where chief executive, recently, um, one of the CEOs of one of the CETAs was discovered to have lied about his qualifications. And we know all the other stories that are in the press. But please be aware that if you're going to be issuing a certificate, that you need to make sure that as far as humanly possible, that it is not possible to actually defraud people. So we have created a, a new template with a database, and it's a mail merge kind of thing. So um, if you haven't got that, please let me know, and I'll send it to you. But those certificates are really important. And then, Terence, as we were talking about it previously, uh, the QR codes, where the QR codes need to go onto the certificates because already the Department of Labor is starting to ask for them. So critical stuff. Um, I will send out a short message on QR codes at a later stage. Finally, proof. Proof that we did it. Proof as in you've got it, human resources have got it, the learner's got it. The employer knows that he's or she's in compliance. I used to issue a certificate to the company, not to the learner, well, the learner got their certificate, but the company, and they would put it into their foyer, a certificate of legal compliance stating that the following people have been trained as per the requirements of the Occupational Health and Safety. That goes to the CEO, or the financial officer, financial officer, and they put that in the foyer. Also very good advertising. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about adding these other things. From that list over there, you'll see that there's a host of things that you can add. Essential, critical, vital aspects that you can add. So just take a look at that while I grab a sip of water. There we go. How do we add them? Creative, be innovative, make your own stuff. Those are two posters that are made in PowerPoint. And if you want them, I'll send them to you and you can modify them. And those posters can then be stuck up all over the place. But it's not just posters like that. You can put up or create all kinds of things that you can use in the workplace. I've seen some innovative things that you can honestly, like, just copy, where people are just so clever. And that's what I mean by customizing and adding to, creating a flavor of, wow, this is ours. This has been done for us, as opposed to a generic program. Okay, so let's get back to this question of communication because you've got material, you've got 13 training programs, more are coming, and what do we do with it and why do we do with it? Well, why do we do it? Uh, in section eight, it said we must inform, we must provide instructions, and we must train. And there is a response to those. Information where people go, oh, you've informed them, prove me that you've informed them. Do you have a list, an attendance list? Do you have a register of where you've informed people? Have they signed anything to say that they've been informed? And these are things that you can share with clients to say, where is your register 
of information provided to employees. Remember, we must inform them of their scope of authority. Let me see, where's your register? That could be something that you can develop and use. Then instructions, let me see them. Remember I said, out of the hire comes this manual, or say for procedures, or operating procedures, or whatever you call it. But a manual that says, this is what we do here at our organization or this department. And then training, well, we spoke about the sex education and the driver training, where it's a skill and you can measure it. But bearing in mind that if we do the training this year, we may have to do a refresher training next year and the year thereafter and the year thereafter so that people are upgraded. Bear in mind as well that when you train somebody, let me just use the health and safety representative. You put them to a one-day course. That's a very common thing, maybe two days sometimes. And then on that one or two days worth of training, they have to serve the entire period of a year or two or three as a health and safety. With no further input, nothing, just like that's it. No upgrades, no CPD, no further additional. Uh, you, you don't take them from a junior safety rep where you've got health and safety rep, where you've got the senior safety, health and safety rep looking after them like a mentor to the stage where they become the mentor, to the stage where they become a master health and safety rep, where they become the mentor. No development program. That's something that you can sell either to your client or your employer so that there's a development because from that base, you can possibly appoint them as supervisors. And remember what we were supposed to do for supervisors back then. But now you've got potential supervisors coming up, people that are getting a much better understanding of, of the whole health and safety scenario and we're readying them, we're developing them. Okay, then we come to section 19. I will honestly, I don't have money here, my, I think Penny's got my wallet, but I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can show me any company that does section 19 and keeps a record of it. Or maybe I shouldn't make it a hundred bucks, maybe a thousand. People don't even know it exists. We have a compulsory requirement on us to promote health and safety. So keeping a record, having a promotional program, critical, critical. Maybe I should just withdraw my 1,000 Rand offer because now all of a sudden people who watch the video go, oh, we've got it. So I'm going to nullify that and I'll just send you a copy of my book. But genuinely, let me show you what I mean by that in a moment. But there are other reasons to communicate health and safety. We need to persuade people, and it's a sell. This is a sell. This is a mindset that you're selling. It's not rules and big Viagra finger and people thumping the table. We've got to sell people on the behavioral side of health and safety. We know that. We also need to inspire them. And you as a facilitator, instructor, trainer, we need to be able to get these people going, wow, damn, I want to do this. I want to be a health and safety activist. And then the last one is we need to entertain them. Because health and safety is boring, big time. I am guilty of that. I think almost every single instructor or facilitator or trainer is guilty of that. I can remember doing a major management course with a large, well-known organization where it was about three weeks worth of training. I don't think we saw that guy's face. His back was turned to us all the time. And he droned on this sort of academic voice. And after a while, we started falling asleep. It's pre-cell phones. We couldn't even play on our digital devices. It was terrible. It was, it was like, what a waste. When he could have had maybe 20 converts, 20 people going, yeah, I want to be a health and safety person. Fortunately, something that, and I love it. Okay, let's quickly get to section 19. And have a look at that. Read it for yourself. It says, an employer shall in respect of each workplace with two or more health and safety reps being designated. Establish one or more health and safety committee. We know that. And at every meeting of such as contemplated in subsection 14, consult with the committee with a view to initiating, developing, promoting, maintaining, reviewing measures to ensure the health and safety of his employee at work, employees at work. What do they mean promoting? That's promotion. And you know for a fact that Coca-Cola is probably one of, and I'm not sure how the Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola thing works, but one of the biggest brands in the world, and you cannot go anywhere in the world without seeing a Coca-Cola sign, and they will not stop promoting. 
even though they're one of the top sellers, if not the biggest seller. We don't do that for safety, we do it once. The guy comes in for an induction session, it's boring, it's bland, he goes away, might have seen a video, um, he hopefully um, got some information that he can use and remember, attention, retention, and recall. But when he walks out, there's no advertising program. There we go. Now, there's an opportunity. If you're so creative, you can use this as an advertising How? There are lots of ways. So recently, I had the privilege of going up to Katu, to a large mining organization, where they have a health and safety day. They have their own expo. They brought in a speaker, which was me, and I did a motivational session and did some legislative stuff as well. And then they had their providers and their suppliers set up in this big hall with the employees, there was quite a lot, maybe five, 600 of them, they could meander around and they can see the personal protective equipment provider. They could see the guys that were doing dust monitoring. They could actually meet up with the people that do their medical surveillances. It was phenomenal. It was a health and safety day. And that group, you may know the name of the group, they do that worldwide once a year. What about the other 11 months of the year? It can be debates and exercises and field trips and videos and presentations and projects and theses and competitions and games. I saw a company, in fact, um, not in the health and safety world, but they use it for marketing, where they've got all these young millennials. These guys are so cool, man. I mean, they've got all the technology. These guys are like, wow. And they then have a competition amongst their millennials saying, who can produce the best video? And it's a big customer relations thing. And these guys team up and they, they make videos using the technology that's available in their cell phones. They then have a competition. They judge it. They announce the prize winners. And those prize winners then get some or other benefit in terms of additional training. Like they can go on a videographer course or a script writing course or a voiceover course or a, an acting course. Or how about that? That means that our millennials who are now completely out of the scene here with health and safety, those millennials go, hey, health and safety is cool, man. Because people have asked me on occasions, can I do voiceovers and things like that? The answer is yes. Use your own people. Use your own people. You've got the technology. If you've got a, I've got a, um, uh, not a Mac, um, PC, laptop, Microsoft. You can make videos on this thing, which are just absolutely phenomenal. And why not? Absolutely. Microsoft Media has got this ability to make videos. Maybe I'll do a video on that so that you can see how to make your own videos. But honestly, if you look at that, and theater, we, we know and have heard of industrial theater, but you can actually teach people so that they can then take this message and teach people. It's about people helping people so they can help themselves. So this business of promotion and creating awareness it's, it's exciting. It's dynamic. It is something that anybody and everybody can do. You can come up with logos and slogans and brands, and you can come up with, um, yeah, here's an idea for you if you want. Um, anybody can use it. I'm not, I'm, it's not copyright. I, I was thinking about playing around with this whole promotion thing of health and safety and coming up with this idea where we could use some sort of animated characters, but not comedy and not not cartoons, not cartoons. Health and safety is too serious for cartoons. But animated characters. And I then went, okay, how can we do that? Well, we can have this animal family and we can have mom and dad and brother and sister. And the animals, I was thinking, okay, like what's a serious animal? Something that we can all relate to. Well, in, in Southern Africa, we've got African hunting dogs, which are quite unique. Beautiful, powerful, strong. And this would then be my S-T-O-P program. S-T-O-P. Stop. Did you see dad is the supervisor and he says, no. You understand? That's the father's role. Then we have the mom and she is pots. Pots, as in feeding, as in nurturing, as in developing people. That's the human resources manager. And by the way, I, I keep on saying this. I don't even know where they are. I go to conferences and workshops and I go, any human resources people, they've by and large forgotten about health and safety. You go, no, it's a safety guy's responsibility. I spoke at the uh, Employees Assistant Professional, EAPASA, and uh, health and safety is not on the agenda. These are people that are in the employee assistance role and game. Health and safety is not on the agenda. That's a massive organization. So POTS is the mom who nurtures. That's human resources and training and development and people like that. Then 
we've got Spot. He's the supervisor's right-hand man or dog <laughs> who spots. Could be the health and safety rep, could be a supervisor's assistant, it could be somebody that's out there inspecting and looking and helping. Could be the health and safety manager. People that are auditing, they are spotting. That's the son. And then the last one is the little girl, the daughter, the pooch. That is Tops, T-O-P-S. And Tops is the one that gives the awards and the recognitions and the t-shirts and the badges and the certificates and the caps and all of those sorts of things. And there, there's a program and you can, you can brand it. So it's the animal family, it's four little dogs, mom, dad, sister and brother, each one has a role. And then each one could have a colored paw print. And for instance, stop is red. So whenever you're doing your rag tagging, you're putting yellow, uh, red, uh, paw prints on there, or cautionary paw prints, or green paw prints, saying it's good. So play with that idea. Enough of that. Maybe I can. I can do, uh, what's my ideas? Well, I'm going to start wrapping up, and I just want to talk about this customizing because I said to you early on. And I hope I didn't deafen you. And safety is boring because it's so bland. So that PowerPoint is a very, very powerful mechanism. I like PowerPoint. It's just one of the things I am and do, but I'm going to make an admission here. The PowerPoints in each of these training kits that I've sold you or that you've acquired are very detailed. They overly detailed. And in many instances, people land up just reading from the PowerPoint. Now that isn't the ideal way of doing it. I'm saying, jazz it up, make it look, cool. make it look like something that maybe once again, the millennials, you could use the millennials and say, I need you to take this material and I need you to make it look like ours in terms of our logos, our leverage, our brand, our look and feel. I want you to do that. I want you to add in video clips, sound clips. I want you to add in um, your own photographs and things like that. So here's a slide that I took out of the, um, the hierarchy. And this is the hierarchy of control and we know it and, and so forth. But maybe this just doesn't look good, but maybe it's or sexy. Maybe that's something that you can do. It's exactly the same points, but maybe this is something that people go, oh, that's cool. That looks a little bit like arty stuff. Exactly. You, within your organization, you've got the capacity to do this. So there's a bland slide. It says, photos and graphics, visit www.google.com, search for fire equipment, click on the selected image. Then you can cut and paste. But if you look at that fire extinguisher, it looks terrible. The resolution is really bad. Something that looks good if you're borrowing off the internet or take a photograph. Now, you'll notice something for these um, slides in our trainer's kits. It's yellow and white and black. Those are my primary colors, yellow, white, and black. And I try and get images that have a white background so that it kind of like blends in and looks attractive. And then I make absolutely sure that it's high resolution. Now, this is not difficult to do. And once again, on your cell phone, you've got a camera there with high resolution capacity. You can take photographs and you can do stuff. It's the message home. In the first track kit, you're gonna see a lot of slides like that. And those slides then represent a message. Now, you may or may not know this, but this is called degloving. And it comes as a result of having a ring on your finger which gets hooked and it then starts stripping the flesh off your finger like a condom. Very easy to treat, by the way. They like just unroll it a little bit, cut off the ring, treat it, and stitch it up, staple it up, whatever they do. But would you not agree that a picture like that is like, ah, take off your rings, ah, then you can turn those pictures into posters. And these are pictures which I've collected over the years, and they just happen to be the pictures that I use for my banners. I've got a couple of intra-train or intra-safe banners, and those intra-safe banners I take to places wherever I can. When I was at SIOSH conference um, in May this year, I actually had my banners up there, and we were selling books, um, and people saw who heard. Got that was all done on PowerPoint, very very easy, and the banner itself cost about eight hundred rand, and I think I had three or four of them made. So you can customize your heart's content, and then of course you can even use Zoom, like I'm doing now. You can use Zoom, and Zoom would then provide you with a mechanism to record. Because the moment we finish today, I'm going to hit, or well, I'll hit stop, and then I'm going to hit the convert this into a video. I see the time that we've got already is one hour and 24 minutes, 
and I can then take that video and upload it to YouTube. I'll then send you the invitation or the URL. But imagine this. There are certain things which you have to repeat over and over and over and over and over. Well, make a video. Make a video. We made a video some years ago of CPR when it went from ABC to CAB. I think it was seven and a half minutes long. I have no idea where it is, but it was a video that we made in a classroom when we were doing Train the Trainer. And that video went not viral, but we, we sent it out to dozens of people on how to do the new CPR, the transition from ABC to CAB. And Terence, I know that that's your life. That's what you do. You can do it with a video. And it doesn't have to be perfect. What we're doing today is more than enough. You can save yourself a fortune and a lot of time doing it. So my suggestion would be get your head around these elements. We've got the training material. And obviously, that training material is customizable. And you can take it. You can modify it. You can mix it. You can match it. You can cut it. You can paste it with my blessing. The only thing we say is please don't resell the trainer's kits. But if you're putting a training program together where the people are now paying to attend the workshop, thumbs up for you. Great. If you happen to be in-house and you're doing training in-house, go for it. I believe that by, by doing all this stuff, you'll develop a reputation for yourself because the health and safety field is completely under-supplied in terms of, of professionals who are known. I ask a question so often in my training sessions, I say, who's South, African, South Africa's number one health and safety guru? I don't aspire to be that. I've got my role in life. You can see I'm getting a little grayer. I'm getting fitter and cycling and kayaking and doing those sorts of things so I can live a long life and write lots of training material. But who is South Africa's number one author in health and safety? Who is South Africa's number one speaker? Who writes articles for newspapers, magazines? Who does a regular health and safety blog? Who's got the reputation of, here is an expert. Let's go and hear what he or she has to say. For the ladies, I, I almost never see women on the health and safety stage or platforms as speakers. It's a wonderful opportunity. For anybody that is aspiring to, to develop a career in health and safety, wow. And people pay. People pay to have me fly up to them. I'm, I'm going to KwaZulu-Natal to do a workshop in, I think it's in February. They pay for the flights, they pay for the accommodation, they pay for my speaking engagement, and they buy 120 books. I don't know how many books they buy. But I hope I'm getting through that health and safety isn't just standing in a, in a classroom going blah, 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 blah. It's a lifestyle. It's a, it's a behavioral process. It's an exciting thing where we can motivate people and encourage them and inspire them, where people will come out of a workshop like this going, I want to be part of the whole health and safety thing. I want to be, I want to be a contributor. I, I, I use the word an activist. I want to be a health and safety activist. But then I want to take this message into the community or clubs or churches or temple or groups, wherever I am at. I want to be the person that stands up in front of the group and says, guys, we're going to be starting this event and we're going to make the announcements. This is health and safety. This is health. I want to be the person that goes to my daughter or son's school and says to the board of governors, I will come and do some health and safety training with you. I've got the material. And by the way, I'll give you my blessing to do that. Got the material, I'll come and run a couple of health and safety courses for your faculty, for your staff members, or even for you as parents. And with that, I want you to go away with this and say, health and safety is dynamic. It's to me, I love it. I will never retire because I love the subject so much. I will lobby, I will go to the government and I will say to them, this is not right, this is not right. I will participate where possible, or I will be an associate. I will get involved with other organizations. And my role at Saosh at the moment is that of an advisory member. And I'd like to encourage you to consider joining Saosh if you're not a member yet, because they are now providing information and updates which are awesome. For the providers, I recommend that you become a corporate member, because there are certain accreditation mechanisms over there that you can take advantage of. And certainly from my point of view, next year, in 2019, I'll be chairing the Saosh conference in Madrid. And to me, that's a great privilege. I can share and give back. In closing, I want to tell you that Penny and my motto in life is to give people hope. And there's four letters over there, H-O-P-E. It's our role, our goal, to help others prosper and excel. 
And with that, I want to say to you, I love working with you guys. I'm looking forward to the future as we can obviously go through the processes of with more training material. And I want to say, if you have any feedback after the session, please let me know. I have my details over here and you can contact me. You can contact me online, which would allow me to, uh, I just pick up off the website. On WhatsApp, I love WhatsApp. Again, another free medium or practically free medium. And you know that I'm on Zoom and of course through our Facebook page. So I want to wish you well. I want to wish you everything of the best for this, the um, festive season. And for those of you that haven't been able to attend the session, I really wish that, I trust that this has been beneficial to you. So from Penny and myself, we say thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being an affiliate. And we say to you all the best for the future. Thank you and goodbye.